and then they say, but you can't actually use those keywords because that's what Indeed, LinkedIn, and Robert Half is using, and you can't spend enough to get ahead of them. And so we go for secondary keywords, things that are much closer for us. So me, it's diversity and inclusion topics, keywords around that, um, women in the workforce, but no business owner is out there Googling mom, need a mom to work at my office. Like, that's just not how people go about finding time. Maybe somebody is because he's (laughs) super intelligent. Some of these, yeah. (laughs) Either super intelligent or super weird. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Hey, welcome to the CEO Parenting Podcast. I'm Thomas Cox. This show is all about hearing stories from business people who are also great parents and also great spouses. What we want to do is we want to talk to people that are doing great in business, but also doing great in life because I want to break the stigma of someone that's doing great in life is working a thousand hours a week. And that's not what we want to do. So if you're enjoying, please subscribe to all the things we are on Spotify, Apple, YouTube, all those different things. Um, it's most of them are at thomascox.co. Our guest today is Delphine Carter, and you have to look at her name and really pronounce it out. It's Delphine Carter. I am so glad you're here. Thank you. Well, thanks for having me. So it's you were surprise. you were a um, a recommendation from Ari Hicks. Ari Hicks is one of my favorite people. I don't even know that you know Ari, but she follows you on LinkedIn. And she's like, hey, this lady seems really cool. Well, I started looking at emails, and you and I had emailed in the past. I think it's about what you do. So how about that segue? Nice. (laughs) So was it about helping you find great talent? I think so. Okay. Yep. So So tell me me about that first. What we do. Yes. And then I want to go back in time. Mm, okay. Okay. You realize I'm older. It's going to no. take a while. Okay. So Bulo is the company I started. And Spell our it. B-O-U-L-O. It is actually French slang for work. Okay. Oh. Um, yep. My background is French. Oh. So we help women stay in and return to the workforce by matching them with flexible job opportunities, offering upskilling, and then a community of support. So this is a question I had. Why do you do just women? We don't. Okay. So here's what happened. When I first kicked off, I wanted to include all caregivers. This is for caregivers that need flexible work arrangements and still care about their career. Okay. Okay. When I think of caregiver, I think of a 90 year old mom. So that's what happened. So when I explained, let me say this, I have no idea about this. So all these questions are totally like, this is why I don't talk to you beforehand. So these go are ahead. good. Yeah, yeah. These are good. They okay, actually so, even help me explain so, the business. So caregiver. It was I think the wrong of like term. I, I cared, cared for my dad the last ten, day, last ten days he was alive. That's a little bit the same, but not really. Well, it could be. Now yeah. there's a lot of us that are the sandwich generation where you may have to scale down work because you really have to get invested in your parents' health and and how to keep them safe. Okay. And so we, I would say, caregiver, and the lights wouldn't go off in people's eyes. You know when you can see people like really get what you're saying. Sure. So finally, I was like, moms, we yeah. help moms stay in, re- and everybody said, "That's my wife. That's my sister." That's what I want for my daughter. So everybody clued in super quickly. So we accept anybody on the platform. Male or female. Male or female. But in any age. And even people that aren't mothers that may be taking care of a brother or a sibling. It's really somebody that has um, a commitment that they've made personally that they have to uphold and they still want their career. You have loved this person. Sure. And- they are now in a state where they need extra attention and to to not be able to give that because you have a job requirement right. or to give everything about you personally up to care. It just helps that caretaking experience be more fulfilling because you can do what your passion in life yeah. is, maintaining whatever your career choice mm-hmm. is, but you can also love on the people that are in your life that you've made a commitment to. So yeah, the part, the, one of the things I think I'm, and it's not a brag, but one thing I think I'm good at is connecting people. And I love the fact that I know more about it because there's, I can think of people that could use what you do that honestly, sometimes Delphine, people, the women or men don't have time to go look for a job that is super flexible because sometimes those jobs are like a needle in a haystack. That's right. And so what we do, the value for the mothers, the dads, whoever it is, is that the people on our platform have already had the conversation with us about Hey, these are the people that we help. These are the people that we're going to find you. So can you offer flexibility in hours, location, or culture? 
what are you willing to give so that they can feel a little more balanced? So when you come to our platform, you already know that conversation has been started. Right. Um, and you don't have to kind of weed out the ones that don't buy into it. Okay. So you've got two different sets of people that you service. You've got me, the business owner. Yep. So how would Thomas, the business owner, whether it be meal fit, table and time, whatever it is we mm -hmm. own, how would you... How does it work with the business owner? You come to our website. We reach okay. out to you. Probably those emails that you yeah. got were probably, me, you know, finding business. Right. And so you come, you say, hey, I need somebody part-time, full-time or contract. And I say, okay, here's the, um, there's a person on my team. Why don't you talk with them? They'll get everything set up, ask you all the right questions, explain our process. We're very process driven, which I think has been our success. And we post the job. We send you three to five candidates within about five to seven days. You say, yep, I want to interview Jane and Jennifer. And then we move you through the process. And then once you found the person that you want to bring onto your team, that's when we talk about the fee. Okay. So here's the question I have. Everybody talks about this and it's really like kind of buzzwordy these days. Okay. Um, process. You said we're really process driven and that's what part of our success Explain what that means. We have cadences, we have steps, we have behaviors at each step along the way that our team performs to help keep the customers, the candidates on track so that it moves fast. It's a checklist. It's a checklist, which is really what, yeah, that's what a process is. Cadence sounds in a way. really fancy. But it's yeah. a checklist. It is. When I think about cadence, it's like there's a metronome that's happening in the background that's just ticking away. Yeah. And you're like, okay, this is when I'm supposed to do this. This is when I'm supposed to do the next step. Every business book you read says that there has to be a, what do they call it? They call it process, but they call it um, systems. Yeah. Process systems. is. Uh, you yep. think that's now, okay, let's go back before um, Bol Bolu. Bulo. Bulo. Yep. How, what was, what was previous to that? So we'll work backwards. Okay. So what was previous, right, previous to that? Um, I had, so three out of four women has a nonlinear career. That was me. What does nonlinear mean? Um, you didn't start in marketing and move all the way up the chain to become the CMO. So I graduated from college with a mass, or, yeah, with an undergrad in psychology and French, got a master's in international business. Where'd you go? Um, Auburn. Okay. I'm sorry. Um, just kidding. I'm not. <laughs> just kidding. I'm just I <laughs> it was amazing. Guy. I love Auburn. <laughs> <laughs> um, so graduated, I got a job. Whoa, whoa, whoa. In let's go back. Let's go back. French and then international studies. Why, why, why the draw? Like you got the French word and then French. Yep. Like what's the, what's the so affinity there? I grew up, I didn't move to the States until high school. I grew up overseas. My dad worked for GE and my mother's French. And so oh. I lived over there and then we moved to Florida right about high school. That's so much. That's so fun. It was, it was amazing. It was the be Belgium, Switzerland, France. It was the best experience. So you lived in all those places. How many languages do you speak? I speak two French and English, but then I can do pretty well with German and pretty well with Spanish. Just because you grow up speaking both languages, because my mother's French, my dad's American, um, your brain picks it up a little sure. bit easier. So. Man, that's awesome. It was fun. It was a great life. So so your dad's American. He moved there to work, and he met your mom in France. That's right. And they get married. Have you? You got any brothers or sisters? I've got an older brother. Okay, so then why did he, why'd you move back to the States? He felt GE was going through a shift. Uh, that's when Welch kind of was coming Jack. up. Yeah, coming on board. So GE was going through a shift. He thought it was good for us to go to college in the States. Um, hmm. and so we moved back and I think it was the right decision. I think it was right. I moved. The tough part was moving to Florida in the eighties from Europe where there is low riders and neon and yes. I mean, vanilla ice. It was, yes. it was a very, it was a culture shift for sure. So are the college, you don't know. I mean, you may know, are the colleges in Europe, are they better or worse? Is it different? There, what? there are some great colleges for sure. So the system's very different especially in France, when you graduate from high school, everybody immediately goes into these certain disciplines. Um, and so what, it's a difference. Uh, if you're in engineering, there's certain engineering schools that you go into, but it's not but you college. Got, so you got to pick at 18? Yeah. Yeah. It sucks. It does kind of. That's, that's really the tough part of it because it took me a bit. I think I kind of always knew psychology, but I didn't know what I wanted to do with it. But psychology was always a draw for me. Okay, so you move back to the States, you go to Auburn. 
Yep. You're the pretty French, pretty girl that's French and speaks French and English that everybody just thinks is really cool. I was just trying to fit in. That was my <laughs> entire was goal. Was like, I was just trying okay, to so, live. So tell me about, um, <laughs> tell me about like that experience and then what made you pick those, those majors? Cause I don't, no anybody that has those made. Obviously, the French thing I get. The I French get now. was a gimme. Yeah, like, sure. It was why not? I got this. Yeah. You need me to teach this class? Like placing <laughs> out early on. Yes. You know, it was just a get. Why not do yeah. it? And so psychology, <clears throat> though, I'd always been fascinated with psychology. I did not want to do therapy. That was okay. not my thing. Um, what I was really attracted to was industrial organizational psychology, which means. Taking a, this is probably going to go back to the process thing, taking a process, making it more efficient, better. Sure. Like I'm the person who with the groceries, I'm going to figure out how to get every single bag in the door. That's my wife. At the same time. Yeah. She she makes her list based off of the flow of the store. That's right. Yeah. She's fabulous. Yeah. She is. So. I'd like to, I'd like to find her a job. I'd like to to meet your wife. Yeah. yeah, And I would like to meet her. Um, so it was, that was what was attractive to me was the psychology behind people's, people's behavior that made businesses better. So a lot of the lean Kanban type stuff that was coming out at that stage. So you're doing that, go to college, then what? Um, I moved to Charleston, South Carolina because they had a big port. I thought it'd be a great way to get my foot in the door in international work. Um, I worked for an engineering company there and I helped start a new product. So I was introduced to somebody who was launching um, home fragrances. And I liked the idea of building something new. Home fragrances was not popular in the eighties. It was like potpourri was kind of coming out and all that. And now I say potpourri now and people are like, what the heck? Yeah. What is that? I know that's on your grandmother's toilet somewhere. Exactly. It Um, smells like cinnamon all of them. (laughs) (laughs) That's so true. I remember testing the cinnamon smells. So I learned, and this is where you never know where life takes you. So I learned how to do that. Then I ended up in a sales job at a different customer company, customer success. I had a weird segue after, um, you know, in the early 2000s where I traveled internationally a good bit and started doing some of the work. With work. It was. Okay. Yep, it was for work. At that time, um, I met who was going to be my husband, who's now my ex-husband. Okay, so... So you just kind of have a smattering of jobs, it's a but smattering. it's all like kind of got a little international feel or no, because I'm not picking up the international. You say it you travel wasn't a lot. until that last, yeah. that middle job in the 2000s where the international really played in. I okay. couldn't get my foot quite in the sure. door that I wanted. What I should have done, but I'm a little risk adverse financially, mm. was to just move up to New York and just giving it a shot. But- I knew it was expensive. Super conservative I knew there was financially. A lot. Yeah, I gotcha. just like to be. Yeah, I get it. So anyway, that's where it all, I, I really believe for a lot of careers, you look back and you finally can see the pattern oh, yeah. that came out of it all. But at that time, I thought I was just jumping in the di- different disciplines. Um, the dream job happened in 2010. Okay. 2010, I ended up as a product manager at a local tech company, and that was everything that I was meant to do with my entire life. It was fabulous. What did you do? So I was a product manager. Okay. My entire role was to find pain points for our customers okay. and build tech to solve that problem. And huh. It was so much fun. Really? The psychology comes into play because yeah, sure. I'm trying to figure yeah. out how to solve it for you. And then learning the process the, of how to solve it. The process. Yeah. I mean, it was just, and I love fixing things. I yeah. love solving problems. It was great. Puzzle. You like, you like puzzles? I love puzzles. I like those too. Crosswords every morning. Yes. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, so, so dream job at 2010, where did that transition yep. to? Um, I did that job all the way up until I started Bulo. I moved from Daxco is where I was working. I know Daxco. Oh, they're fab. It truly they was are. the most incredible training How ground. long did you work at Daxco? Till when? Eight years. 2018. So 18? Yeah. Then I went to so, Shipped. Okay. So the back end of Dax, your fat back end of Daxco years, we started doing food there. I'm 18. Yeah. You probably, I'm you know sure. Ellen Ortiz? Yeah. Absolutely. She worked there. Yeah. 100%. So let me tell you about Ellen. This is why I love Ellen. So we went to, to do food there. And at the time, John, my oldest, was nine, nine. And we did food there one day. And Ellen just scooped her up and was her special helper. No. And she just, Ellen just had my heart at, the, at that point. When she's someone, a wonderful person. She's an amazing human being. When someone 
loves your kids, they automatically have you. And you could tell that it was so genuine. And then she left and goes to Iron Tribe, and we had a connection at Iron Tribe because we were doing trying to do food at Iron Tribe. And then she leaves Iron Tribe, and she becomes a real estate agent and is absolutely killing it, doing wonderful. And then I've done do some stuff with her for real estate. She's, so we still, and she called me two days ago about doing something for the Birmingham Track Club. So she's like, so she's smart. wonderful. She, oh, oh, she's brilliant. Just, and credit to Daxco was, my kids were raised at Daxco. Yeah. They would come into the office. Nobody mm -hmm. would blink. I mean, it was just one of those places that yeah. was very kid friendly. Everybody I've talked to that's worked there has absolutely loved working there. So, okay. So you leave that. So, so why did, why did you, so you got a dream job. You've worked there eight years. Why did you leave that job yeah. to go do your own thing? I was a recruiter reached out to me and said, there's this senior product. I was a senior product manager at Daxco, but there's this other senior product manager role. And I was at that time, I had a manager that I didn't feel like I was learning from. Okay. And I am somebody that I just want to keep learning. Keep getting better. Keep getting better. Okay. And so the recruiter reached out and said, hey, we've got this person. They worked at LinkedIn, built product at LinkedIn, all of these top tech companies. And I was like, well, surely I'm yeah. going to learn some stuff here. So I went over to Shipped um, and worked there for about eight months. Oh. It was not long. The person who I came to work for was let go for some not great behavior. And then... Um, at that time, Bulo had already started kind of in the background. I'd started testing it out, playing in around with mind, it. In your mind or like actually I've been doing, side doing it on the side? I've been doing it on the side. You're, you're at uh, Shipped only eight months. End up where you're side hustling a little bit. I'm trying with, it. So I've, I've, got, I've got forms online where I'm bringing women in okay. who are interested. I've got peers that I'm reaching out to in the Birmingham community that are saying I need help. And so I'd, we'd start matching and tested it out. The demand was there. We started making some money. And then finally I was like, I had a big moment where every night I'd wake up at 4 a.m., my brain spinning. Listen, I, I tell I'm going to stop you and interrupt you. I tell people this. <laughs> I get asked this question all the time. I tell people, and I say, because I got a friend of mine who wants to start his own business. And I'm like, he's, he makes a bunch of money. He's like mid six figures. And he hates his freaking job. Mid six figures base and then mm. bonus of almost the same freaking salary. And he hates it. And I'm like, dude, you got to figure out something that you can do. And that's what I did at the church. When I was working at the church, I did this at night. I did up in the morning, do my work, and then did it at night. And like, you're risk averse. You've already said it. Mm. People that are risk averse have to have something already going before they take say, the plunge. I got to go. Or you go take out tons of debt to get going. And that's not me. It's not my style. And I was, a, I had just recently become a single mom at that time. Yeah. So it was one of those where I, but the signs were there for me. There was a huge spiritual presence on that decision where I felt like there was something telling me every night at 4 a.m. or every morning at 4 a.m. saying, hey, listen to me. Yeah. You need to go do this. Okay, so here's a really technical question that a lot of people will ask and want to know. So you're at Shipped. You've got a salary, whatever you're making there. How much were you making off Bulo, Bulo before you quit? N nothing. Hardly, nothing? Hardly. We, we were bringing in revenue, but I wasn't paying myself. Okay, so... How much were you bringing in, I guess, is the best question. Not how much were you paying yourself. Gosh, I think that first year we brought in like maybe 180000 That's awesome. I think it was pretty, it was good. I mean, it was, and truly it was good because the demand for these women and the caliber of women that are out there is incredible. So you brought in, you were brought in 180, but you were still working. Yep. How long did you, how long did you do both? Um, until right before COVID 2019. And then you, okay. So yeah. you do it in 2019. And then I just you said, said, I got to go. Yep. I've got, I've, we had hit the point where I could start paying myself. And then I just thought that this was something that had to happen. Okay. It absolutely had to happen. So how much did, okay, so we were talking off camera about tech and I, I posed a question. I said, most tech is 
male driven, meaning like yeah. coders, things like that. You never yeah. hear of a woman coder. You just don't. And so like, I don't know. The I know, numbers I know, aren't I know strong. All tech is coding, but like. Right, right, right. The whole suite, and you look at the whole suite of a company, the majority is typically male until right. you get into maybe the marketing and HR departments, unfortunately, stereotyping. But but why why is it male? Why is tech male driven? I think a lot of it is when tech companies get started, yeah. it's easier for a male founder yeah. to get them going. A young, the picture, the Silicon Valley, sure. young guy, yeah. um, typically a young white guy. Yeah, absolutely. Have a little more finances behind them. They're propped up, set right. up in a way that's a little bit different. And so they start bringing in their friends. Mm. He starts bringing in their friends. And a lot of the engineers that graduate or a lot of the tech um, professions are male oriented until now, lately, I'm sure you said you had a daughter. She's yeah. probably got STEM at school sure. that can help her, help her understand. So some headway had been made okay. into getting more women into tech, a lot of great programs that were attracting them in. Then COVID hit and it almost wiped out the presence of women in the tech scene. So COVID wiped out the women in the tech scene. Well, actually in all business. There was over 2 million women left the workforce during COVID. And they had to leave because they had to take care of Person, some, someone yeah, had to take care of kids. That's it. And that sounds really sexist saying like someone had to take care of kids, but like, I don't, I mean. You know, typically women make less than their spouse. Sure. And so if you're saying somebody's got to stay back to control this chaos, yeah. I make which salary you make are you giving up? Yep. Yeah. That's right. And so until we can get some salary parity. That's typically going to be the choice is that the woman's job is so, what drops off. So you are. You, that, so, so you transitioned into what you're doing now. How did you? How did your business do during COVID? Did I, you take a step back, or does it? I mean, I did a pivot. So it was yeah. a temporary pivot. So a great friend who also had been my boss at Daxco. Her name's Brittany Somerville, an incredible person. She, um, when COVID kicked off, she asked me to join a group from all around Birmingham okay. that was coming together to figure out how do we feed people? How do we take care of our community during COVID? Okay. Shipped was on one side of it where they were trying to figure out what do we do about groceries? Remember when sure. grocery stores had no food in them? Yeah. So it was this, a group of people came together and sat at Innovation Depot over a weekend to figure out how to help the people in Birmingham and the infrastructure of Birmingham. I ended up making a connection there where I helped them bring on and place volunteers okay. and paid people to give back to the community. We got a grant. Jared Weinstein was a big part of that. He's okay. an incredible contributor to Birmingham. We got a grant to help put people back to work, pay them, and then do things around our community like testing, sewing masks, They'd go work at the zoo and help keep the zoo going. I mean, they did yeah, tons of stuff. It's called Birmingham Strong. Wow. It was a, it was it, it, incredible watching the city come together. So y'all, like how long did you do that during COVID? We did that all the way up until probably the end of 2020. And then we went back to our roots. At that point, people were hiring again. There yeah. was more stability. So you took a seven or eight month hiatus off Bolo. Bolo. Well, we Bolo. worked. Yeah. We were still doing some placements, but we were working Your nonstop time and effort was trying to get trying to get those people onboarded, paid, managed. Yeah. But it was it was great. It's a great it, pivot. It helped us survive. Great. So you started back in late twenty. Yep. And then twenty twenty one and twenty twenty two. Talk to me about yeah. what y'all how how it's grown I mean, it's or what it's done. It's gone great. So we um we raised money in 2021 from a great group of local investors in Birmingham, family okay. offices and angels. Um, we hit about 2.4 million in revenue last year. Okay. And we um, just have huge expansion goals right now. Okay, so let's, again, real technical. So when you get investors, so some of the people don't understand this, the normal everyday person doesn't understand this. When you get investors, and say so they give X number of dollars, let's just use a million dollars because it's a round number. Yep. Um, they give a million dollars. Does that dilute your equity in the company? It how does. much does it dilute your equity? It depends on how you negotiate and mm -hmm. it depends on your valuation. So the valuation is what the two of you say, this is what we think the company's worth. If we today. sold it today, it would be sold for $3 million, $2 That's million, right. dollars, whatever. Yep. And okay, I'm going to give you, a, say it's worth $3 million. I'm gonna, we, we, we both agree $3 million. Yep. I'm going to give you a million. 
And so they get 33% of the company. Ish, something Usually, like that. Like if you're going above million, it can be like 20% is okay. what you'd, you'd typically hit to. You'd want at the series A round, which is typically maybe your third fundraising to be um, still have around upper 40% of the company. Okay. So why do you need to raise multiple rounds? And, and so, because here's the thing, yeah. you're, it's not the way you started. Did you? Did you start with no, investors? No, okay, so you no, started we, like we just self-funded. you, self-funded. Yep. Why did you go, why did you get investors? We had to grow the technology. So we had always wanted to be a tech company. We did not want to be a brick and mortar staffing. It just wasn't, or recruiting, no. it wasn't our goal. So we needed the investors to build the tech. And um, so we built some of it. We had some time along the way, we were making sure that we were doing it right. What I didn't want to do after all the experience that I'd had at Daxco and shipped was just throw money at tech for the sake of it. So we ended up raising the money. um, And then at some point you can decide, look, I have more stuff that I want to do and the time is right, right now to do it. So I need to raise money. Mm. Um, We are profitable. So we actually kicked off a fundraising round in October. Why would you do that if you're profitable? Because we have some huge growth goals and we think the time's right. Every round of investing, series A, series B, whatever, the equity gets diluted, yep. correct? Correct. <sighs> and you just hope you build it big enough. Big enough to where your percentage that that is That becomes enough to- like a rounding error. Yep. Sure. Okay, so when you say build tech, that's a very fancy term. You hear it on YouTube. You hear it on TikTok. We're building the tech to do this. It's a little pretentious sometimes. It, it, uh, I don't think of it as bougie, but I think of it as like, like, t- t- okay, so t- take the, this is, again, we used the round fictitious number of a million dollars. What do you take the million? Because I'm asking questions that yeah. the everyday person doesn't probably understand. You take the million bucks. You take. We had to build the tech. What does that mean? What did you take the money and build? You know, it's so interesting about that. So we took the money, you take the money and you push it towards developers to do their work, to release features. Pay people. Pay let me, people. Let me unpack this like a fifth grader, third grader. Yep. You pay people to develop technology, i.e. software, processes, systems. That security. you can, security. Okay, that's good. That you can use in your business so that Susie, the person that's signing up, it's an easy, streamlined process for them to get information, give information, and deploy information. That's right. That's exactly it. Do the, I need to do your pitch deck? Yes, I'm just I'd kidding. Like you <laughs> How are you with PowerPoint? <laughs> yeah. The other aspect of it, and a lot of companies, this is missed for a lot, is how many tech companies pour hundreds of thousands, if not millions, into marketing. So when you look at the basis of Uber and Lyft and how they got themselves going, It was millions on marketing before they ever became profitable. So that's a big part. A lot of tech companies are marketing companies. And I'm going to be honest with you. I don't understand that world. I don't understand. I got to stand up. I don't understand that world because we've never, and it's the whole school thought thought of, I've never done it that way. So you, you get the money and you've developed the tech. Right. Okay. But you're profitable now. Yep. Okay. What does the next round of funding go to? Does the next round of funding go to sales? Does the money ever go to sales? Does, does you, in your case, does the money ever go to sales? Does the money ever go to marketing? It 100% goes to marketing, for sure. Uh, Even in uh, round uh, one? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because it, brand awareness is everything. It is. And it's so expensive now uh, to really get your voice out there unless you come up with some very creative ways, which becomes more difficult. But a... a 50% probably goes to marketing, filling the pipeline for sales. So that's where sales gets it. The rest goes into develop, development for the features. Okay. I got two questions. Okay. This is the most technical episode <laughs> we've ever done. And I absolutely, you get for having a product I manager. absolutely <laughs> love it. Sam's probably laughing over there. Okay. So I, we, we talk about marketing and everybody says, oh, they spend it on marketing. That is a very, very loose term. So break that down for me. It's t- you think about it in channels. So you're putting that money into different channels. You've typically got email marketing. You've got ad campaigns. You've Stop. got ad campaigns. Ad campaigns. When you mean ad campaigns, do you mean 
uh, Facebook, Google, Instagram, or digital, you, digital, yep. all digital. And including LinkedIn. LinkedIn is huge right now for yeah. ad campaigns, for sponsored content. So the other part is SEO. Okay. When you, we, I, I hired somebody for SEO early on to find keywords, right? I thought yeah. all it was. I think that's hard. Like the hard part about SEO is like, what are people searching? Meal prep is pretty easy. Psychology, right? Like what are, when you're sitting there standing, trying to figure out what you're going to order for the week or eat for the week with the kids, what do they put into Google? But right. the hard part is this, Delphine, you know exactly what they're looking for, but as the boss, you don't know what that, what Susie is thinking. I mean, you do, but you, you don't. You kind of do. You don't know it in a granular enough right. way. And you're also probably in your line of work too, but also mine, you're going against some really big money spenders sure. who are looking for those same keywords. So then you're like secondary keywords, tertiary keywords, yeah. but- we hired a company last year to do SEO, Moondog Media. What? Moondog Media. Okay. Um, they, watching them do SEO is fascinating. How? It is I machinery. Know like, tell me that. That's, that's, that's fun to hear. Um, God, I don't even think I'm going to do it justice. So yeah. not only do they find the keywords, but they figure out the content game that goes behind it. They figure out every little piece of your website that is causing friction with Google's algorithm for what pushes you up to the top. So they say the keywords, are this, is, this is your stack of keywords. And then they got, okay, okay, Delphine, this is a stack of keywords. Then we need to make content based off of these keywords. That's right. Then. And then they say, but you can't actually use those keywords because that's what Indeed, LinkedIn, and Robert Half is using. And you can't spend enough to get ahead of them. And so we go for secondary keywords, things that are much closer for us. So me, it's diversity and inclusion topics, keywords around that, um, women in the workforce, but no business owner is out there Googling mom, need a mom to work at my office. Like, that's just not how people go about finding time. Maybe somebody is because yeah. he's super intelligent. Some of these, yeah. <laughs> Either super intelligent or super weird. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There's, so it's figuring out exactly what is going to work. And they changed um, we had like nothing coming to our website. We had some couple hundred and now our organic search, which means us showing up organically when somebody types in something about hiring is amazing. All thanks organic, to that work. But not organic because you're paying moon dog meat. <laughs> correct. Yeah. Correct. Worth every dime. Okay. So this for is somebody great. that does it right. So someone, Oh, so well, are you, are they requiring you and having you write content on the website on TikTok on whatever. They write it. So part of they the agreement it. is that they write it, I review it, I tweak it, they post it. And they are sending me five articles a month. I mean, it what, is- where Okay, are they, is it all blog because mm -hmm. it's SEO driven? Yep. Okay, so, so talk about that part of it. Do they Are they taking any of that blog stuff and doing any, any of it on any kind of social media platforms? They do not- what they have done social. is they give us a spreadsheet that says, here's your keywords. And then I have a person for social media and she um, makes sure that we use them in our, so those keywords in our social media and also on LinkedIn, write heavier content like newsletters, but that those keywords that they've established works, we spread it across every public facing piece of content. The game is content. Sure. It's content creation, content spreading. How active are you on? So you've got, uh, so, so there's email, there's ad campaigns, meaning digital, and there's SEO. What else? And are social you, media. Yeah. And social media. So, yep. so ad campaigns, but then also organic social media. Correct. Just consistently posting content that attracts people what is and your engages. What's one social platform that you guys, that you guys either, I hate to say followers because followers matters, but it doesn't matter. But like, what's it can the, be the a most vanity metric. Oh, absolutely. What's the most effective one um, that you have? I saw you on Instagram. Is probably. it really? Yep. Yep. Huh. And if you think about it, that's where a lot of our members on are on. Um, it's also where a lot of business owners are at night scrolling. Uh, LinkedIn is incredibly good for us on both counts too. What on, about Pinterest? You know what? We hadn't gone there. Same with Twitter. I just hadn't, we, we hadn't been Pinterest able to focus. And we had a freaking, it is a disaster. Like we had two horrible people at Pinterest and they've tried to get us to come back because here's the thing we get organically. 
with Table and Time, we get over 2 million views a month. On Pinterest. Yeah. But think I about what we that. do with food. Food, food, food well, and pretty pictures. That's what Table and Time is. I know. And we don't have the pretty pictures no, for Pinterest. But I have seen, we've got a lot of competitors that um, they do use Pinterest. To, so a mom's scrolling and, hey, I really want to figure out how to work and take care of my kids. Yeah. Uh, so it would be a great one. We just haven't. It's, a it's one of those hole. focus on one thing, get really dang good at it. Yeah. And then you can start so adding you more think to your Instagram plate. and LinkedIn for you. Instagram and LinkedIn are your two best ones. Are, is Facebook effective? Cause I feel like Look, I, 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 my social media person laughs at me about Facebook. I just, I don't even want to hear the metrics. It, none of it makes sense. We'll do fabulously off of a post drive all these people in and then it's crickets for a bit. It's Facebook is just very different for me. I can hear the frustration. In your I'm voice. so frustrated by Facebook. Really? I, I don't, people come to us. I can't, we can't really tell who they are. It's very, there's some ink. There's so much inconsistency in the Facebook metrics. I love data. I love metrics. Um, Instagram is much easier to measure and LinkedIn to measure and see results. How are you? So, so we're transitioning. So you said number, one of the number one ways you spend is on marketing. You obviously have to develop the tech. Mm. The next thing you said was spend uh, was on sales. How do you, cause you, cause again, I want to break this down. We, we took some of this, you know, fundraise money and we spent it on sales. What does that mean? Like, you, is that humans? Is it what, what, tell me what, it's tell humans, me what you mean. so we hire, but typically the human that you hire is going to bring enough money to cover that. Mm -hmm. If you hire right, yeah, one hopes. Hire, right, yeah. hire with Bulo. Just yeah. kidding. Um, so what that means, if you picture a funnel, yeah, it is making sure that you have names following all the way through in that funnel. So it's putting tools in place to help find names. It's putting tools in place to help. Um, but that's a marketing game too. Yeah. Sales, well, right? which is typically why you say sales and marketing. Those, yeah. those typically are so tightly knit. Um, if it would, if you were going to say just sales, then it would be tools to help the sales team be more efficient. Like what? Um, calling software. We're a hundred percent remote company for the longest time. It really bothered me that our team was using their cell phones to call people. It felt intrusive that I was asking them to do that. They're reaching out. What if somebody has some bad behavior and starts sure. bothering them? Didn't like it. So I got calling software, um, once we were able to make some money calling software so that they could dial from their computer. Tell me about that. Um, it's called cloud, cloud call. And so the team has a phone number from our CRM system, which is client relationship management system. What, who do you use for your CRM? We use something that's closely tied to the recruitment service called Bullhorn, but we used to use pipe drive, which okay. I loved. Love pipe drive. Um, Why did you leave pipe drive then? Because it's time we to your, wanted to okay. put the whole company on one platform. I got you. I got you. Yep. Okay. All right. Process. So, so you get yeah exactly. <laughs> so you got to sacrifice sometimes. So cloud call. Susie's on the computer. Susie's been the name I use for the random. The generic. Yeah, generic person. Susie's on the name yeah. on the computer. She's able to enter the notes, tag the person. Just can handle some of that admin junk way more quickly. We can also learn a lot more. Because we can see, well, how long does the average call take? And when I'm looking at human capital projections, figuring out, okay, if we're going to launch in this new market, how many calls do we have to make? What does that time look like? It gives me more data on making decisions. How many on your sales team right now that, that, that humans Four. just- Okay. So tell me what the- you have a, you have Inside a head? sales. You have a head? Head, three team members. What does the head do? She manages the sales team by making sure they're using the right messaging, solving any problems with customer interactions and keeping them motivated and supported and um, part of a team. How do you pay in her? She is strong base, lower commission because so much of her time is management. Is management. Yep. So the other, so, so the, what about the three others? Are they more, are they higher percentage? Exactly. Lower base, higher commission. And so she also manages the recruiters now. She just got a promotion. Manages the recruiter. Okay. Yep. So how much time does your sales, so technical, how much time does your salesperson spend with your, do you have a marketing human that's, that's on your staff? Yep. How much time does Susie, the salesperson 
and Mary, the mar- the marketing person, spend together? Not as much as I would like. If there's one flaw in our system is those need to be much more integrated than they are today. Um, Can our salespeople see the the marketing stuff? Yep. So they can see it all go out. They're typically included on it, but also the CRM system that they go into shows them the emails. So it showed us that we sent Bill three emails and then he finally clicked on one and that creates a task for my sales team to go call Bill immediately. Now nobody's going to click on the emails. <laughs> Cut that part will. out. I'm just kidding. <laughs> okay. Um, man, this is extremely technical, but I love it. Okay, so... As a generality, where are you placing these people? Is there some... um, Concentration somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. So we have a lot, um, a greater concentration in services. So that's accounting, legal offices, um, financial services, anything like that, and tech. The reason being those are... Tech's too broad. Give me something. uh, Software development. So startups, we do really well with startups typically. Man, those are, aren't those high paying jobs though? Well, we've got, we place, our average salary is, is for the people that are full-time is in the seventies for the full-time workers that we place. There's some, these are very technical. So we've got two personas, do it all Darlene and re-entry Rita. Yes! (laughs) Okay. So, so explain those two. So re-entry Rita graduated from college. Potentially she worked for five years on average, 10 years, probably worked for 10 years, stepped out of the workforce. Once the kids potentially came along, she's ready to get back in. She has skills in marketing, financial services, admin, customer success, sales, project management. Okay. Do you ever find that Rita's behind on the times? Yep. Yep. And so, yes, <laughs> but, look, raising babies. but look, there's no, And I try really hard to make sure every woman knows there's no shame in that. Sure. So much has changed in the workforce just since 2020. Mm. We use Slack a ton in technology before. Hardly anybody else. It Zooms. That wasn't like part of your everyday language. Now it is for everybody. So what we do is help make sure that they get access to the right training programs to understand how to catch up. And we're launching our new upskilling platform in September which will help give them that focus content to get okay, them ready. So you got Rita and then you've got. Do it all Darlene. She has always worked. She loves to work. She finds she can't get her kid to football practice. She finds that she's late to every game and she just feels like she's not able to support her kids like she wants to. She wants a company that will understand that um, because she leaves to take her son to practice does not mean that she's going to miss her goals. So they measure by results, not by the amount of time her butt is in a seat. Is everybody that you place slash hire, not hire for your company, but place, is everybody you place digital or or, no, or we've got a mix. Oh, you do so have a mix. So okay. hybrid, hybrid, remote, or if your flexibility is in the culture, Daxco, for example, for the longest time, we were all in office, but if I had to take my kids to the dentist, then I'd just go finish off at home and nobody blinked. We were measured by goals, not by showing Hours. up and walking off the elevator. Right. So, because there's a position I possibly have in the future that is a hybrid position, 85%. Hybrid's great. 85% remote in the office. People do. 15%. People do like that interaction, the face to face. They just need the majority to be. The one girl's like, that does that. She's like, she likes getting dressed up. Well, you do. You just. Yeah, sure. You're tired of your gym clothes that you just throw on because it's fast and efficient. Um, But what you appreciate about those remote days is you're not in two hours of traffic trying to get from downtown to Chelsea to get back to your house, to cook dinner, do the laundry. When I work from home and my kids aren't there, I'm extremely efficient. Not not only is it the 22 minute drive, the 22 minute drive does not bother me, but it's not 22 minutes. It's 30 each way because there's getting in time, there's sitting down mm-hmm. time, there's all the way. So it's probably 40 minutes total, 40 there, 40 back, just tra- the transition. I just, I am extremely comfortable at my house. And so I love, I can't do it because my kids, I have two homeschool kids. Oh, uh, yeah. So I can't Unless do it all you, the time. you've got a very sequestered. I don't. Yeah. I difficult. have a wonderful office. People would give their left arm for an office like I have. But... 
our house was built in the 60s and the office is in the um, original dining room. That sounds really funny. So it's got no, it light. doesn't. I'm in Vestavia. All, so many yeah. homes are built like yeah. dining room, yep. living room. So we have a dining room and a living room. You walk in, there's a big freaking room that. What's this room for? It's yep. just it's a sitting room. It's an old school sitting room. And then there's the dining room. My office is in the dining. Room. It looks wonderful, but there's no doors. Yeah, that's difficult. Now, granted, I work from four to you know from four to five every morning, and then from six. 20 to 7 15 every morning in there and i'm fine you you figure out a way to make you it work. Out yeah a way. my kids come home to my house every day after school somewhere between three and five like i was on a board meeting from 4 30 to 6 last night and my kids are down there doing their thing and yep. it's it can be done very sure. efficiently um, you just have to be able to have that space okay so tell me this how do you charge how do y'all make money we talked about percentages we talked about fees today give me an example yep today we do a percent of the annual salary percent of the annual salary one time one time that's okay it. for we're launching in may a new subscription that allows for a company to come on and search for the candidates themselves post jobs there's a monthly fee and then if you find the person that you want to hire, there's a smaller success fee. And so it's the ability for a, for we serve small to medium sized businesses under 500 employees. Um, it's a way for them to hire in a more affordable manner, potentially more hands on for them, mm. but we give them all the tools to try and do it on their own. What's the average business size that you service number of employees average yeah, I would probably say about 50 to 100 is, oh, wow. so is bigger companies. where we are. Yeah. Um, we moved up market in the beginning. It was much smaller. It was the probably under 10. So we're probably 10 or 15 now. Yeah, we're 12. Okay. Yep. Um, it's a great size for women to get a flexible culture and to be able to um, re-enter and really shine and get promoted. We had one woman that we placed. She'd been out of the workforce for five years, six years. After three years at the company we placed, she became the CFO of a new product that they were launching. I mean, wow. there, there's just so much potential with a smaller, small to medium sized business. What's the biggest, what's the worst part of your business? Like what you do? Worst part? Um, when there's somebody that doesn't quite understand why people need flexibility, trying to explain that to them can be a frustrating. Business owner a business owner doesn't quite, they come to us and they say, Oh, I'm a flexible culture. Well, tell us what that means. Um, you know, it's totally fine if she needs to go out to lunch. That's your flexibility. That's what, that's what you're offering that she can leave the office mm. and go to lunch. And it's just helping them understand that a mother's or a father's de desire for flexibility does not mean that you have to cut back on the expectations. So if you want to leave because you want to go coach Little League, you should be able to do it. And it's on you to reach your goals. You'll figure out how to make it work. But here's the problem with that. The, the problem with that is this, is a lot of companies aren't uh, goal-driven. They're not. Oh my gosh. Yeah, that's th that is the number one problem. But yep. they're not goal-driven. That's like, right. And I so when so I- my, my friend that has the job that he hates, he gets there at seven. He leaves at five every day. Four fifty-five. His bag is on his desk. Clicks at five o'clock. Sucker's gone. It's total. Could care less about. I mean, like they make money. They're extremely profitable. But the sucker works fifty hours a week, chained to a desk. That is the thing. Is they're not. They're they're not gold. -driven. How does he know that he's doing well? I, I have I have I, such a I thing about using, goals. I keep using this guy as an example, sure, because that's because that's where I'm. It's a fairly common story. It's very very common. Yeah, very very common. Well paid, no goals. Very Show well paid. Up. Yeah, I get here. I'm paying you this much money. By the way, you'll be praised because you walked in that door at seven fifteen sure. or seven ten before everybody else. Yeah. Did you do more? We don't know that actually. No. But I think that's part of what, why that why the people don't understand that. But I'll say this: some of the stuff that I have is is not um, is not flexible. Like you have to be here at six to get these things done. Now, you don't have to leave at two. You can leave at three. You can leave at one. You got to get the the, the That's work done. That's flexibility. That's flexibility. That is. But it like, is. It's making work 
look a little bit different. And for some person, if they've got a spouse who can take care of the kids in the morning, that's a great job because then they're home with them after school. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's a dream job for some people. Yeah, and, and we do. We have a, we're going to have to start hiring more because we're going to have some gap. Like we've got a, the perfect job for the mom that wants to work a little bit, but just wants to work during school days and school hours. Yep. So they drop Susie, off, they drop, drop Susie off at school. Yep. They need to be here about 9.30 or 10, and they need to go home about 1.30 or 2. It's a fabulous job. It's a great way for somebody to get their skills back. Yes. It's a great way for somebody who may be a new mom who's trying to figure out what her career is going to look like and maybe scaling down. Um, and 50, maybe somebody that needs 400 bucks, bucks a week extra. That's right. Well, that's what what we can't discount is the number of women that had to leave the workforce because they couldn't afford childcare, but mm. the family still needs that income and still needs additional income. And so that $400 makes it, especially now what groceries are 8% higher than they used to be. So right. it makes a difference. Well, every, and especially in a, in a mid, mid income family, you know, three or four or 500 bucks a week, month, whatever. It makes, makes a huge it makes difference. a difference. Totally so, does. Um, this has been wonderful. <laughs> I feel no, like just we the, went eight different just, directions. Just the technical part of like all, because I can't tell you how many people don't understand some of the terms that you use, like raising money. Well, what would you raise money for? Well, you, we explained that. You know, what, yeah. when you say sales, what, you know, all those different yep. things. Um, what else? What else do, do I slash we need to know about what it is you do? Um. Really just an understanding as remote work before COVID, 7% of companies did remote work. Now it's- Seven? Seven. Now it's 35%, but it was clearly, it was much higher, but it's it's slowly dropping. And what do you so, mean? Oh, you think it's dropping from the 35%? Correct. Why? Um, it actually just dropped to 35. It was somewhere around 38, 39. Um, I think it's because companies are unsure how to measure- the work that their team is doing, and it goes back to what we said earlier, because they they making goals takes time and effort and metrics, and it's difficult for companies to create those goals. Hmm. So we do really well working with companies that have set goals, that have the infrastructure to set those goals, um, because they just have an understanding that these people are working. They don't need to worry about him working, walking through the elevator at 7 a.m. to make sure that it's somebody's doing, I was on a call with somebody actually. And he asked me, I don't know. I don't know if my team's working because we're hundred percent remote. And my first thing that I said was you wouldn't have known if they were working, if you're sitting in the office next to them. Yeah. You they could be on playing, Facebook or on the CRM. There were times I'd walk by somebody in some offices and they were watching Netflix. Yeah. I mean, you don't, you have no idea unless you put goals in place. So talk, how, talk to me about your kids. So two like, of them. Two kids. How old yep. are they? A 15 year old boy. Oh, wow. Insane. Mm -hmm. Incredible kid, but they become dumb. Boys become dumber for a little bit. Oh, my goodness. Smart kid. But some of the decisions is, I think he's broken two windows in my house. Oh, okay. Playing lacrosse. I mean, it's just so. At least he's doing something. He's doing it. He's practicing. practicing. He's playing lacrosse. But when I said, oh, and why, why is that happening? He's like, I don't know. The balls keep going towards the window. And it's like, no. Change the angle, son. No. So, uh, and then I've got a 12 year old daughter. Awesome. And they go to Vestavia. They go to Vestavia. They're okay. Fabulous. So, so single mom. Yep. Okay. Talk the about involved dad. Involved dad. Yep, great I was going to ask that. Good. Fabulous like, co- dad. Co-parent, co-parent great. Yep. yep. Okay. So talk about how, so how much are you in the office in, in a office? Are you in an office at all? Is office at home? I'm an office at home and I'm like you, I'm a morning person. Yeah. So I get up at about five 15 and I can just kind of stroll downstairs, start, do all their lunches, feed the animals, and then I'll start working. Those are my most productive hours are probably between five and eight, maybe. But then- Do you take them to school or out of the bus? Um, we, this is a whole nother topic oh, of conversation. Okay. How do we not have bus systems in Vestavia, Mountain Brook? I don't, I don't know if Homewood does or not. But anyways, there's no bus. So imagine what that does to a working parent. I have a- all fair opinion about that. Okay. We can talk later. Um, <laughs> no, we, I mean, yeah, so I have a carpool situation. Other fabulous moms in my community. So we all trade. A, you take them one or two days a week That's or whatever. Right. That's, That's right. awesome. It's a great Okay, community. so they get out of there and you, you got, 
all day to, man, that's great. I knock it out. Do you out. have a great office at home? No, it's oh. awful. Thank God for Zoom backgrounds. It's awful. Nope, don't. Why? I've got my two screens. Invest in a good office. I should. I really should have actually thought about that. You Get know, they a say that. Co- the- <laughs> Get a good desk. I've got a standing desk, which I love. Um, but- you, no, listen, the next time we talk, you need to take some, some of this money you're making and you need to invest oh. in something that you enjoy going to. Something that looks good, something that feels good. It's why chicks buy expensive workout clothes because they want to feel good and they want to have a cool outfit to go to the gym in. You need to buy a cool desk, buy something great that you like. Oh, this is good. I need. I should. I need to. I need to. I need to. It just hadn't been the focus. So my my wife is thoughtful. Some. So she bought me a desk and it was custom made. Oh my goodness. It was, it's as heavy as this room. It's so heavy. And it's, it was custom made for me with, it's made of steel. It's made of wood. It is. That sounds gorgeous. Wonderful. Cause I was working at the kitchen table. Well, so I wander around the house a little bit. Sometimes I'll sit on the back porch and work. Sometimes yeah. I'm at the dining room table. I like to move around. The, but I tell you what I do, the habit that I do have that's kind of weird is I have a very uncomfortable chair. That's not good sciatic but i don't want to be comfortable but that's fair too i don't want to be like that's smart actually so my chair is like i mean i bet the chair is 50 years old it's wooden it is like clunky but like jackie's like you need to get a better chair i'm like i don't want to get a good chair because if i have one of these gaming chairs that's got all this stuff you'll stay in it i don't want to do that nope 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 you need to walk around yeah yep now one thing i don't have on my desk it's not it's not a standing desk and I don't really, I, I don't know. It's not a thing for me though. I love standing. Do you? Yeah, I really do. It helps me. F- I think I might have some undiagnosed ADD yeah. potentially. And so I, I fidget. So standing sure. helps me sometimes really focus. I just need to put some more stuff on the walls that makes it more the work zone that, that you resonate. I'm a huge reader. What are you reading right now? Um, it is a fiction book and I can't remember it. The last book that I read that you have got to read okay. is called Hangry, which is the guy that launched Grubhub. I saw that. I've so seen it. So stinking good. Really? Oh, it's so good. That's wonderful. That's the last one I read. Yep. I'm actually in the middle of reading one for a book club that I do not like. Don't read it. it. Well. Put it down. Nah. Put it down. Don't get we sucked keep in promising we are going to finish this. It's a CEO leadership group that oh, I'm in. Okay. It's called Quit, and the the purpose of it is to is to make you not hold on to things for the sake of holding on. Kind of like this book. <laughs> <laughs> How serendipitous is that? <laughs> I'm actually going to have to use that example yeah. in our meeting. <laughs> yeah. So I'm talking to this guy. Today. So I made the decision to quit the book. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. So Hangry by Mike Evans, founder yeah. of Grove Hub. I'll it's so it. good. Really just a good, easy read, but you learn so much. Great. Uh, what is the best book you've read in the last two years? Oh, goodness. There's a book called Burnout that is more focused for women. And it it is it starts off by saying, the one thing we're not going to tell you to do is to find time for self Care. Secret to unlocking stress, the stress That's cycle. That's right. And it has helped me. I've probably referenced it in my head more than any other book. Really? And the reason, one of the biggest ones is it talks about celebrating even the smallest win. Sure. When you celebrate, you feed your brain all the happy chemicals, and then you can handle the stressful moments better. What happens to me is something good happens, and then I think, well, what's around the corner? And so it's taught me to celebrate the smallest wins. Yeah. Don't focus on the on the on the negative. Don't worry about what's next. I used to have a boss. We would win games. Like I coached college football for ten years, and so I had a boss that we'd we'd win the game, and he'd come in pissed because on third and seven, Johnny jumped off sides. I'm like, we play eleven times a year, and we just won one of them. <laughs> Can we celebrate? 11 days a year, we get a chance to prove and make our money. And you are dwelling on the fact that Johnny jumped off on third and seven and we still won the game. But I'll say this. A lot of us do that. A lot. I'll hear my son come off of the field from his lacrosse games 
And I'll be like, congrats, you were aggressive. Yeah, it job. was great. He's like, but I did this. Well, okay, but this Ooh. book helped me help my kids yeah. too, to celebrate, just celebrating that win closes the chapter with a high note in your brain right. and then you can do the rest. That's awesome. So tell me about like the navigating with kids. So, okay, so here's a good other question. And I, we'll talk about this a little bit. Like at 3.30, 4 o'clock, I know you just said you were on a conference call till six of the night. How much do you work at night? So John, what's Adult. your kids' names? Owen and Sophie. Owen and Sophie. Owen and Sophie get home, whether it be after practice, no practice, whatever. Does Sophie play sports? She was in cheer. So Great. she just tumbling. And, okay. Yep. So she's involved in that. Do you work when Owen and Sophie get home? Yes. Here's what I do. Okay. They walk in the door. I put my stuff down and I come and just chat with them. Owen is typically right out the door because of practice. So that's a window of time that I want to just check in on their day. That was something that was very significant for me when I was working was I felt like that time when they just got home from school was just a big caretaking moment with sure. something. And so I coordinate my day to make sure that I can hang out with them for about 20 minutes, 30 minutes. I do not work. I do not often work late because my brain doesn't do it well. well when I look back at what I've done, it's typically junk. The one exception is my kids and I will sit at the dining room table. They'll do their homework. And if they don't need my help, then I'll sit and work with them just to sit and hang out with them. And we'll, randomly start talking or she'll ask my brother or my son for help in math because that's not my thing. Yeah. Um, and so it's kind of an engaging moment. So that's the only time I'll really work at night. What questions do you ask your kids when they get home? Not a trick question. Uh, yeah. I mean, probably not the best ones. What was fun? I do yeah. ask what was fun, like what was good, any drama. I feel like if I don't try and suss it out, I'm not necessarily going to hear about it. Um, and this is the one I probably shouldn't always ask, but how were your grades? Like, did you get any tests back? Do you have any tests we need to worry about? That's not a bad question. I've, I feel like there's a lot of pressure. Vestavia just did a great thing where a bunch of high school students said, parents, this is what you need to know from a kid. And what they said, we have a lot of pressure about grades, a lot. Peer pressure and parent pressure and school pressure. Vestavia is self-admitting that we're putting a lot of pressure on our kids for grades. The students, the upper class <sighs> students, they were seniors. And it said, what we wish our parents knew. It was a session. Oh, that's good. Isn't it awesome. So okay, good. So, okay. The kids are telling, their kids yep. are saying, this is what we feel. Yep. This is what we feel. And so their point was, you know, it, you, I don't know. I went to a small private school, but it, it's very cool to be smart now. Like, it's very cool to get good grades. So what happens yeah, if you're- Yeah, I don't never, never really. <laughs> I, was, I could throw a football. <laughs> well, that's what happens now. So if you can play football and get A's, man, you're yeah. like, you're up here. Yeah. So the kids where school was not their best thing, school was not my thing. There's some shame in that now. Really? Yep. So there, you've got peer pressure about getting good grades. Damn. But then you've also got parental pressure. And then colleges are saying, by the way, you need a 4.1 to get into Better than Alabama. Better, than, Better perfect. than perfect. This is what you're up against these days. And so their point was, we've got a lot of pressure. We don't need undue pressure. I, I could really care less that my kids make good grades because I want them to be well-rounded. I want them to be able to talk extremely well to adults. I want them to carry on conversations. I want them to be able to ask good questions. And I really could give two flying craps if they pass algebra two with an A. I want them to, here's what the one skill I want them to have. I want them to be able to think, two skills, think critically and read and understand. Because if you can read and understand, not just read, Read and understand. You can do anything. That's EQ. It is. So I, the only thing I push is reading because, and like, for example, I tell my kids, go to Amazon, pick any book you want and, and send me the link and I'll buy it for you. Now, obviously, I always check it out and make sure it's nothing crazy. Right. I don't, I don't care how much it costs. I buy it. And I've got a 14 year old that is just 
drum through three books over 300 pages in about two and a half months. Girl or boy? Girl. And I noticed this. So my 11-year-old has typically been a better reader than my 14-year-old. Okay? Extremely odd. But I noticed this past week that I made, we were sitting down, I made her read something, and she started reading. And I looked up at Jackie, I went, she's reading so much better. It was all that practice. I'm telling you. So I could really care less that, that John and Tegan and Georgia are going to make straight A's. I really don't care. I want them to, I want them to do fine, but I, I, it's not going to bother me that Tegan comes home with a B and whatever. It's just not. Now, if it's a B because they didn't try, okay. I want them to put effort, but I'm not going to be on them about studying X number of hours a night. I'm just not going to do it. There's actually a great framework for that called Strength Finders. Yeah. It's a management book. Mm-hmm. And that changed. I read it before, I think before I was a parent. And it changed how, so I expect you to be really good. I expect you to get A's in the classes that I know you have that capability. Yeah. The other ones, we'll talk about B's. Sure. We'll work, we'll work through that. I don't need, and I know that's counterculture right now. It's not the right thing, but my best hires have always been B students. Always. We had Jen Ryan. Do you know Jen Ryan? Yeah. She's a wonderful. She's so impressive. Absolutely. So Jen Ryan was on here and Jen's background is really impressive. She went Ivy League. She played sports at Ivy League. She's Goldman Sachs. I mean, she started a company. Start, I mean, she's crazy. Crazy good. Um, we talked about hiring college athletes. Yeah. Because here's the thing I don't understand. As a college athlete and as a former college coach, I got no clue what regular non-athlete students did all day. I got no clue. Because I was, the rule was 20 hours a week. The rule. Now, you know, it was a lot more than 20 hours a week that college athletes spend out doing <laughs> sports. I sat there and I, and I, here's what I told, I told someone the other day. Had I not worked, had I not played college football, I would have been a millionaire. Because I would have worked all the time. Now, granted, I was a 3.0 student. I mean, I made A's, B's, and C's. I was a history major. I didn't, like, burn the midnight oil or nothing like that. But, like, I got no clue. And so, for me, college athletes, if you were a college athlete, it proves to me that you can do multiple things, manage time, and... Um, work together with other people. I'm, I'm a huge team I would 100% sports, agree with that. Huge team sports guy. The, the, wish, the one thing I wish I could translate is if you're not necessarily a sports kid, what could you see on a resume that translates into a similar, maybe it is working. Did you work while you were at school? Yeah. Were you able to hold a job, not get distracted? Um, I hired a girl one time from your alma mater. and um, She was amazing. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> or not. <laughs> mm. I hired a girl one time and <laughs> she had never had a job mm. at all. And like I, again, played college sports and had a job and she'd never worked anywhere. And I hired her fresh out of college. And I thought, cause she interviewed well. She was probably taught to interview. Did not, could not conceptualize like meeting goals could not conceptualize figuring out like some days are going to be six hour days. Some days are going to be nine hour days because you got these certain deadlines or things you got to meet at three fifty nine, She was, had her purse in her bag. She was checking the box and she just didn't concept. She just couldn't understand that these things had to be done. And I'm not an hours guy at all, but like just when you're not, not hitting yeah. it and you're not doing hours, there's a problem. Yes. And so, but I've traced it all back to it's because here's the thing. She looked at me like I had a unicorn horn coming out of my forehead. When I told her that when I graduated from college, I went to I moved to Atlanta. I coached football in Atlanta for a little bit. But I told her, I said, girl, you got to. I said, you, if you need more money, because she talked about how much I was paying her because she had a long drive. I'm like, look, get another job. Work at night. And she goes, what do you mean? I go, when I was in Atlanta, I, I taught school during the day. I coached football in the afternoon. I went to school multiple days a week to get my uh, certification. And then I cleaned buildings at night. 
It's the hustle. I said, all I did was work. I said, now here's the thing about working like that. The thing about working like that is this, is number one, you're making money. It may not be a ton of money, but it ain't what you make, it's what you keep. And I had no time to spend any yeah, money well, on anything. <laughs> I didn't have any time to spend any money. I said, and you're living with your mom. And I right said, out of school, you don't have a ton of responsibilities typically. And you so don't you have can... any debt because your mom and daddy paid for your college. <laughs> so don't be complaining about it. And bought it. you a car. Yeah. <laughs> so like, we saw Big Back to College Athletes and like, but I think you're right. If you're not a college athlete, I think that you showing that you were highly involved and not involved like in your sorority or fraternity, but like highly involved and had responsibility. Yeah. And potentially adaptability. You look at Jen, she has done so many different things oh and been successful. And for looking at her, she's just one of those brains that is able to ad- adapt, learn quickly, produce. It's just wonderful. And some of that I think is context switching between school, sports, and then her personal interests. Being probably. able to compartmentalize is huge. Um, well, great. Hey, what do you have for me? Anything for me at all? Because I've asked you a gazillion questions. What? So you've got the two businesses. Yeah. Catering and the meal two, fit. Two different catering companies. Meal okay. fit's also catering. Meal fit does meal prep, but then table and time is like a higher end catering, like weddings, corporate, things like that. Okay. And meal fit, where is that? Where do you find that? So you can, everything's done online. You order online, but then there are like 20 different locations around Birmingham that you can pick up the food. So and it's Delph- health focused. Yeah. It's all like portion focused, health focused, all real food. It's not like a diet, but it's, it's real food. It, our it's goal, healthy eating. Yes. Our goal is to make you, your life easier. Meaning you are the target market. You're a single mom, not single moms, but you're a mom, right. has a job, has kids going in 14 different directions. I have a mom that lives in Gadsden now that orders our food because her husband works downtown. And I looked at her one day because you can order a meal or you can order the food by the pound, like a pound of chicken, a pound of rice, a pound of broccoli, whatever. And you can just portion that how you want to. So everybody's got their different thing. Huh. And I looked at her, I said, Amy, I said, you need to order by the pound. You got all them freaking kids. I said, it's, it's more affordable. She's like, no, I'm not doing it. I'm like, why? She said, because when they're walking out the door, I want to be able to take the meal out of the fridge, put it in the microwave and hand it to them. I don't even want to spend the time portioning it out. And so for her. That's the best idea. That's the best idea. Yeah. She's got four, four boys. And she's going in 14 different directions. Dad works, mom works. She's got four boys. They all play multiple sports. Well, and boys eat about four meals a day. They do. They do, and they're all like full 13 and above. Yeah. So they're eating like, you know, they're eating just crazy amounts of food. So Where'd you coach football? I was at NC State. I was at a high school in Atlanta. I was at NC State for two years, and I was at, in t- at Tennessee Tech. I was in t- cooked for, for 11, but I was at Tennessee Tech for Fun. a while. Fun. Yeah. Okay. So we moved from Atlanta, moved from Birmingham, Atlanta for a little bit, Raleigh for a little bit, and then cooked for, for a little bit, and then came back here. We were gone 15 years. Do you watch Ted Lasso? No. But I just had to figure out your take from a coach. Yeah. What your take uh, was on it. Everybody said I need to watch Ted Lasso. Yeah. I love it. But yeah. from a coach's perspective, it'd, it'd be interesting. Yeah. I've heard he's absolutely hilarious. He's hysterical. Yeah. It, it, and there's some great nuggets yes. to learn. I like that it. guy anyway. I don't even know his name, yeah. but I like, I like him. That's true. So, but yeah, okay. that's, that's what we do. Those were my questions. Awesome. I love the meal fit idea. Perfect. I thank you so much. This has been great. Thank this you. is the this most is technical wonderful. episode. If you have any technical, I hope it if, works. It, it's no <laughs> great. If you have any technical like business jargon that you don't know, this is a great. These these clips will be great to watch. So thank you so much. Perfect. Right, have a good bye. day. Bye.